Hello and welcome to the Plus Graph Exhibition Walkthrough. My name is Elizabeth Sweet and I'm the Communications Lead at Feral File and I am so excited to be here. This is, there is so much to say about this exhibition and I'm really happy to be back with Casey Reese, Ishkra Velichkova, Alicia Ha, James Merrill, Alexandra Yanovic, and Julian Gashadoa. Joni Lemercier uh, might join us later. And we're here today to talk about Plus Graph and each of the works in it. Now, Plus Graph is a show of software and plotter drawn art. And each of the artists here are exhibiting works that push the limits of their craft, each using a wide range of tools and techniques with code and the plotter. Now, all of the collected works here will be plotted and signed by the artists in their studios and sent to collectors at no extra charge. Now, I had the pleasure of seeing some of Alicia's plotters in action, which you can actually see right now going in the back. And I was blown away by the texture and depth of these generative works. It really helped me just embrace this whole new appreciation for code and plotter drawn work. Now, plotters really are quite analog in a sense. And they, you know, they gave us the first means of bringing generative art into physical spaces back in the 60s. And while we have digital printing methods now, like all good things from the past, these vintage machines, these, these, these plotters are really having a bit of a renaissance, it feels like. And so, Casey, I'd love to start with you. Casey curated the exhibition, and it's been two years since the first graph show, which you also curated. Now, since then, generative art has become even more popular among artists and collectors. But as we know, the history of generative art predates this century with plotters as the first tools really able to print generative art. So my question is, why is now a good time for an exhibition of plotter artwork for part two of Plus Graph? I think it's always a good time for an exhibition of plotter artwork from 1960 to now. They're always stunning. Um, I disappeared for a moment because I was just pulling all of the plots from the last show out of my out of my flat file. So like here's Alexandra's. And then here is it's good. And in you know, in doing that over the last few months, what I've really been thinking about is the materiality of these drawings and the way that this group of extraordinary artists over the last two years have just pushed that further and further and further. Like, I think everybody has like been independently researching pigments and colors and papers and textures and like new techniques. Like for example, Alexandra, the show is um, cutting out um, like masks and then using those for applying color, like really innovative, interesting things. And so, when artists were producing drawings with plotters, plotters were industrial machines, you know, made for engineering. Um, they they co-opted them and started using them for producing visual art. They didn't know what they were going to see. You know, there were no screens at that time. So when a plot was made, that was the very first time they saw the result of their work. It was, you know, a lot of artists then and now were using a little bit of randomness, but it was sort of, they would imagine what they wanted to make, they would encode that, and then they would see these drawings. And I think a lot of artists are using the plotter in this group in an experimental way where um, the work is simultaneously this piece of software and also this unique one-of-a-kind thing on paper. Um, and these objects, they have such a strong link in history to the history of drawing and painting. At the same time, they're infinite objects too. The software continues to produce different variations. And so every artist has made their definitive group of 30. And then outside of that 30, there's, you know, many, many more options that exist as well that people can explore through. So that's a, I don't know, a little bit of a little bit of start. Yes, thank you so much. Um, that was a great, a great primer. And we are joined here now by Joni as well. Uh, it's great to see you, Joni. Thanks so much for yes, coming. Thanks, nice to meet you all. Wonderful. Um, so thank you, Casey, for that bit of an intro. I'd love to I'd love to dive into the works. Um, so I'm going to start here by sharing my screen. And oh, wait, here we go. OK, perfect. Um, fantastic. So these are the sets um, of, of works available in Plus Graph. And I would love to begin with Ishkra's work. Um, so Ishkra, I am going to pass it over to you with a question about birds and rabbits um i think maybe quite quite fittingly let me let me get to the work here so 
my question for you is that, so birds play a significant role in your work. Anatomy of a rabbit, but bird brings together your iconic birds and another creature of legend, rabbits. Now, birds tend to symbolize freedom and flight while rabbits can often signify luck and prosperity. Both are symbols of love across many cultures. Now, as I understand it, these animals emerged almost organically in your work. And so when it comes to your practice, why birds, why rabbits? Why do you keep coming back to these very natural organic creatures while using machines and code? Yeah, well, um, it's always funny to me to, to really understand that my work, you know, focus on rabbits and birds is something funny for me. But I think the birds are my most relevant work so far because it was the first time that I realized which was and which is you know still my question when I when it comes for me to 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 do my art and the question is what can we find by using randomized uh, generative systems you know I'm not designing my processes when I started my practice I was focused on data visualization and I had to design really accurately all my outputs and it was not space for surprise right and now that I'm allowing myself to just dive into the systems and see what happens the first thing that I saw my rabbit I my sorry my bird that was a huge question for me because it was like I'm not designing this thing on purpose but I am obtaining something that is similar to something that I've seen in nature so that was my first question can we approach things that already exist in nature by using degenerative uh, systems. And if we can do that, can we use, let's say, a poetic reverse practice to understand how the world is built? So that's, of course, a question that I'm not going to answer by drawing birds. But for me, it's a very beautiful way to approach this question of if we are really unlocking you know, new doors of understanding of things. So. In this project, I I changed a lot my approach to the project because the first time that uh, Casey approached me, I was like, okay, this is very special. This is the second time we meet. I really want to do something special. And I am in this kind of moment of my artistic practice that I'm trying to focus on the minimal structure of my work and see how can I build on the top of that. So my first approach was, can I do something by playing with very very minimal shapes and coming up with let's say two shapes i wanted to talk about love i wanted to talk about hacks i wanted to talk about emotions and i start, started playing with that thing and i don't know how at some point i just left the project for a week and then i came back and i started seeing these birds in my in my work which are not the same as my first birds but they were birds for me. And then when I started plotting them, because it's very different when you see that in the screen and when you plot it. And once I plot like a few uh, outputs and I started turning them and I actually asked kids here at home, what do you see here? And depending on how we turn the paper, we could see rabbits and at the same time uh, birds because you could see the beak and at the same time you could see the ears and some of them. So I was like, okay, now I have rabbits, you know? And it was very nice for me to play with this game of perspectives and things. So I just decided to go in that in this direction, which was very beautiful for me to bring birds to this exhibition. And, and then once I got the, the system, I just tried to be a bit more crazy on the outputs, go back to this idea of very, very simple lines. And some of them are very, very elusive, not so concrete. Some others are more bold. Um, but all of them, I think, have this kind of uh, reminiscence, if this is a word in English, in English, about you know those two elements and and playing with this black and white. I play now that we are scrolling. I I wanted to add a few elements of color. This yellow, which is a color that I'm not very used to play with, it's not um, a very symbolic color for me. But I, I think it it worked re really well with this kind of very light gray. Um, like it's not the opposite, but plays like a, a good contrast with with the rest of the collection, and and this is basically my what I did here, and it feels like a, a very cute project for me, very very personal, and and very very happy to bring birds for the first time in in my plot. 
I love seeing it in this view of seeing them all at one time. I think that really like, yeah, it brings a lot to seeing the whole set. Iskra, is the gray and the yellow the the paper color for the plots? Um, the, no, everything which is black and white is, um, the, the light gray is gonna be plotted in a white paper. The blacks mm -hmm. one are gonna be plotted in black paper and the yellow ones I'm gonna paint by hand uh, the background. So it's gonna have this illusion because I tried with yellow papers, but I didn't find this kind of texture on a yellow paper. So I just bought this, this ink here. And I tried just, you know, to play like a very urban wall, you know, and then on the top of that, um, I paint with my technical pen. So yeah, and actually it was hard for me because when I curated the set, I really, made sure that for me work as a whole which actually doesn't make sense because every collector will will have their own that they're not going to have it in you know the whole collection but it was important for me to just put them together and make some sense of you know the more bold ones next to the lighter ones next to the yellow ones next to the black ones so yeah i really put effort on on creating a consistency in the whole collection uh once you see it together I think it'd be amazing to collect, you know, like two or three or five and to have them in a series, uh, you know, like framed and, and put together on the wall. I think that would just be really stunning. I, that would be great if someone collects more than one, but also if someone collects one, I think it would be very interesting because here I don't have the other one, but I try to play with different sizes, you know, to, you know, to represent, um, the birds, this is the number one. And it will be interesting for me if a collector has one, maybe use those two, like just putting them together in a different rotation, you know, and just display in the wall different perspectives so you can have this bird rabbit at the same time. And so, I don't know, I'm playing, maybe I'll bring a small one next um, next to the, the normal uh, plot so the collector can, you know, play with this game. So yeah, it's all about, you know, this kind of game of what we can see. And this is basically the core of everything that I do. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I love hearing about it. And it's it's funny when I look at it, like on some of them, I automatically see a rabbit or I automatically see a bird and then like kind of making myself like switch my perspective, then you can't unsee you know, the thing that you see second. So um, it's a it's a really special piece. Thank you. Um, next, I'd love to move to Licia. So Licia, uh, and let me pull up the piece here. Um, so, excuse me, sorry. One moment, slight technical difficulty. Um, Okay, fantastic. So you have created, um, let me share my screen. Apologies. Okay. So you created 16 different color palettes for fictional lullaby, each complete with shimmering stars and hand-drawn gold leaf finishes. So how does this fastly layered series reflect the evolution of your practice since the first graph show? Oh, great question. Oh, uh, just, just a little clarification. So each of the piece actually has uh, 16 different colors, uh, but there are a total 10 different color palettes in the collection. Um, so I think it's such a dream come true for me to participate in graph again and uh, to be able to, uh, you know, be in this group again and uh, to, to create something that I absolutely love is just fantastic. Um, so um, my passion has always been in kind of exploring material and finding ways to bring generative designs um, with colors and with physical materials. Uh, so obviously having this fantastic opportunity is just amazing. Um, and I think the uh, major change since the past two years would be, I think I'm getting more, um, I guess, uh, proficient <laughs> at telling my stories. Um, so I feel like at this moment I can, um, I sort of have some of my own languages that I can utilize and rely on 
And I also felt like I can trust my intuition slightly better than in comparison to two or three or four years ago. Uh, so this collection actually turns out to be a super personal and emotional piece. Um, so when I started, um, I just started with super loose drawings. Uh, so I showed this group um, and also posted a couple of very early sketches uh, for this project. And those sketches are basically very chaotic lines and uh, you can't see much of the structure there. And, um, um, but when I saw those drawings, my initial reaction was like, okay, this is the direction that I want to go with uh, without knowing too much of where this actually leads to. Um, and I think having um, been doing this for, I guess, two years, uh, it gave me more kind of uh, encouragement to say, okay, if you think this is the right direction, I just keep working on it. Uh, and I think maybe two, three weeks into the development process, uh, I just realized, okay, this is a collection about evening. Uh, and then I dive into the subject about evenings. So I think about all the moments when I'm having a lot of sauce, you know, the moment before you fall asleep, all the creative ideas, all the worries, they all come at the same time. And they're saying, okay, you have to deal with all of us at the same time. Like right now, if you don't deal with us, you cannot fall asleep. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the inspiration for this project. Um, I have a lot of hat spinning thoughts uh, going on. Uh, it's chaotic, it's complicated. You also have this quite a uh, fast paced feeling. Um, so having all of those visual elements together, uh, it really enabled me to tell a story about me. Uh, so naturally I want to have something um, that is kind of gazing at this visual. Uh, so then I have this uh, star symbols and then the eye symbols getting to the project, uh, which is kind of a magical development process for me as well. I really enjoyed this uh, develop development process. Um, it's also super helpful to have our wonderful group meeting almost every single week. And then we can check, chat about those ideas, uh, discussing all the new developments. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one thing that I felt like I'm really happy and grateful uh, for this show. Um, and just back to the color story a little bit, for this time around, I really had such a great time <laughs> testing out art supplies. Um, so as uh, you mentioned, so this is a color, uh, this is a piece that is kind of really colorful. Uh, so each piece is plotted with uh, 16 different colors. So 13 of them are watercolor and acrylic mixtures. And all the stars are painted with two different glittering and the shimmering watercolor. And the last color, which is used on the eye, is actually a speciality paint. It's a li uh, liquid leaf. Um, it's like an oil-based uh, paint that has to be applied manually. Um, so I think having uh, a lot of opportunity to test and to play with these materials and finally putting everything together into a collection um, has been really rewarding. And so I'm like really excited uh, about presenting this collection through Beth. Thank you so much. It is so colorful and so vibrant. Um, and I love how deeply personal it is. I I wonder like how, you know, in thinking about this piece and sort of what it means to you and what we can kind of take from it uh, in our own personal journeys, what does this piece help us understand about embracing the energy of the subconscious and really taking a look at the vibrance of life and maybe that maybe that liminal space between between waking and sleep? Um, so for me, I always think about uh, information. I feel like every day we are creating information and we are consuming information. Uh, so for me, emotion is part of the emotion that we are kind of producing every day. Uh, so for me, creating kind of an emotional and the personal piece, it's like uh, doing an information collection <laughs> and also presenting that information for me. Uh, so whether subconscious or conscious information, I think um, I just really enjoy this process of presenting them in a language that I'm passionate about. Um, and I hope this collection, you know, could I don't know, make people think about maybe if they have those kind of environment, uh, those kind of moments where they're in, be in between sleep and a dream, uh, what kind of visuals do they have in their mind? Uh, so that's like one question that 
uh, I kept asking myself after creating this collection, I think about, you know, what else do I see <laughs> when I'm in that particular moment? Thank you so much. Uh, next, I would love to turn to Julian. Um, let me get to it. Julian's piece, Mineral. So, Julian, Mineral is full of varied and angular textures that create a multi-dimensional effect on an otherwise flat surface. It feels quite related to your piece, Umwelt, from the first graph show, but instead of strict square partitions, the different techniques you've employed here create the divisions and layers within the piece. Now, in some ways it feels more organic than Umwelt and in others it doesn't. So how do you think about the natural versus artificial environments with respect to the worlds you build with your generative and plotted works? Um, yes, I, 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 as you can see, um, I tried to uh, make a continuation of my work by using uh, Square as a, as a starting point uh, for this collection, this new graph exhibition. Uh, Umwelt was also starting from a square, but using a different algorithm. And uh, this time I started from a square, but from a, a, a different grid, and I used um, uh, random walkers or uh, agents that can, uh, that can uh, move uh, on the grid uh, according to simple uh, rules. Uh, I used really simple uh, termit design and also random walker who can go in eight or just four di direction with one, just one rule, which is common to every every everyone, is that they cannot cross uh, each path created by each other. So you can you can feel uh, if you if you look at uh, each um, each of the of the piece, you can feel uh, behind uh, the the path of each um, of each uh, ant or each agent. Uh, you can press by the way uh, the, the the key. Uh, I think it's a G for grid, and you can reveal uh, behind the structure. I think it was worth uh, having it in the in the in the design of the software. Uh, so you you can see the point which are the paths of the of the different uh, of the different agent on the grid. And so this is uh, yeah the question was uh, natural versus uh, artificial. Uh, I would say that my work is uh, is is not really uh, toward uh, natural uh, phenomenon, but uh, I try to build uh, architectures and uh, also I would say that the essence of my work is the the combination of uh, different uh, techniques uh, to, to navigate and explore what I can come with on a parametric level, uh, meaning I, I'm, I, I, I really work with the, uh, in mind, the what if, and what if I try this, and what if I try, uh, and if I add this uh, layer of complexity, uh, what, uh, what will uh, it produce um, on a visual uh, level? So this is a lot of uh, experimentation. And uh, when we talked about uh, it on Mondays, I talked about the fact that I, uh, for the last two years, I've built a kind of uh, framework uh, that allows me quite easily to um, to build uh, some kind of uh, I, I'm I'm having kind of meta language where it, it it's quite easy for me now to you know to build uh, and assemble uh, some kind and combine uh, visual algorithm. Uh, so I would say it's more. Uh, it's more, my work is, is more about combining and trying to build uh, things uh, by iterating and keeping the same, uh, I would say, the same uh, language and uh, basic language. Like for me, it's a line and also basic uh, geometry and uh, shapes. Uh, so for, for this exhibition, I wanted to try uh, to integrate uh, autonomous agents and see uh, what happens and what what ca I can do with it and if it's uh, interesting I, I I think it is I have two 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 artworks which are uh, a bit uh, out of scope which uh, I, I like in the collection which is which is I think uh, twenty three and twenty four which produce a kind of uh, I I don't know square uh, square based which is actually nice because it's um, 
in the same set there is a circle uh, which is also i think uh, a bit um, uh, rare for uh, gems because there are only three or two, or two circles yes and if you press uh, space you can generate uh, an infinity of uh, of um, of of patterns and of artworks um so yes this is my way of uh, of working and i would say yes i, I i'm more onto an ar architectural way of uh, seeing things than the, the natural way. I mean, uh, than trying to emulate uh, nature. Thank you. Wow. And I love all the little, like the special key actions you can do. Um, it's really, it's really great. And I think, Ishka, I think you commented on Twitter, you said the light in this one, and I keep coming back to it. Like, it's just, it's remarkable. Um, I think yeah, this is a, a very special work from Julian because I I I see a lot a lot of light and that's not so common. I think this kind of contrast that you made in this one it's it's mm -hmm. super nice and it's so funny because you were explaining the project and this kind of weird and when I was looking at the systems I was always stopping at these twenty three because I think it's yeah. very very weird and <laughs> yeah I mean. Agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's what I, I'm looking after. I mean, I, I like. Okay, you have the the algorithm producing some some groups or sets of uh, of outputs, and what I usually like is finding you know some edge cases. Uh, for example, the twenty three and twenty four is an output I really uh, didn't uh, expect. So it was uh, it was nice to to see them appear uh, from random parameters, but also uh, that combination of uh, of uh, paths of walkers on the on the grid, so it's always uh, always nice to uh, to to discover, and and this is the joy of uh, of generative art, I would say. <laughs> Be surprised every time you press uh, space. <laughs> and also just the fact that you, we have these thirty fixed, you know, selected outputs from you, and then mm -hmm. you can keep going. You can see. Tens more, hundreds of more, thousands of more, tens of thousands of more. You can just like walk outside of the space and really find those edges and really find compositions that really mean something to you that you can display and and, and look at outside of this one, that, this fixed set, which I think is a really unique thing about the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that one thing that motivated me for the show was, uh, I think it's, I would say it's quite unusual uh, to uh, release um, a piece of, of software in generative art that can generate uh, an infinity of uh, outputs. So I think the, the the idea is quite nice, and also it's um, uh, people can see how uh, how you can generate in just one click uh, outputs. And uh, yeah, the, the the process of selecting thirty was very uh, difficult for me because uh, I had a lot of uh, nice uh, outputs too. Maybe a plus plus graph. <laughs> I don't know. There. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, yes, thank you so much. And just just so um just just to be clear, the the image that's presented here is the one that will be plotted, correct? But with the software versions, you can see all the different variations. Yeah, exactly. People who will collect uh the set will get the the iteration you see on the on the on the screen, and uh, I I've plotted uh, twenty of them for the moment. But uh, I, I'm running out of paper now, so I I called my uh, my paper uh, furniture today. <laughs> Good, get them on the line. Um, uh, fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Next, I'd love to turn to Alexandra. So, Alexandra, your piece, The Space Between, encourages the viewer to look at the vibrant middle, to see what can emerge from the cracks, to consider the importance of what happens between beginnings and ends. And now, when you think about the time between the first graph show and this one, what have been some of your most important influences on your practice and on this new work for the show? And what do you see between each piece in this series? So it's been only two years and so many things have happened between the first edition and this edition of Graph exhibition. So uh, for this piece, I was um, 
inspired also by uh, illusions and tricks of our brains that make on us like uh, focusing on maybe too complicated things or seeing um, from the mass uh, like uh, life is so complicated uh, but in fact it's rather simple so for this one i focused on negative space to amplify the fact that sometimes we are more focused on the surrounding or on the on the mass and chaos happening around us and we aren't seeing uh, between those noises what's uh, what might be slowly steadily resiliently happening so that was the initial idea and during the development of the piece, I had few iterations how to amplify that negative space. So as you can see, this is the final um, uh, look of the piece. So mostly I'm not actually focusing on the beginnings or the ends. You know, don't know when they are happening, but I'm focusing on the slow and steady things happening between the beginnings and the ends. And I see like all of us in, involved in this show for the past two years, we've, we've been doing so many things, but consistently and strongly. So in a way, it's the same thing with this piece, like in between something happening. Thank you. Sorry, I keep losing where the, where the mute button is. Thank you so much. You know, there's like such a meditative kind of flow to these. I love how I love how they're dynamic in the software, um, in the software so version. So yeah. that's uh, like for, for for the previous one. I also have some kind of animation, so I can't avoid having animation. And we all know those pieces will be plotted, and they will be still, and we will have to choose one frame. But I can't avoid uh, having a little bit of movement and making it alive on screen if screen or computers allow us that part. But then I, I see like one moment in time uh, transferred to a drawing. And could you tell us a bit about, I know that there's like a special kind of process that you went through cutting the plots up. Is that right? Uh, so it's a two part. Um, um, like I like color and I use a lot of colors. And when I'm doing water work, then I have to constrain myself uh, to um, what technology allows me. So I was trying to find a way to add more colors, but in this gradient style, not just uh, too many pencils, pens uh, in different colors. And I realized that I can do two part piece. One is uh, like drawing in black fine liner. And then I'm cutting stencil to mask the parts that are negative space and filling in uh, through the mask with dry pastels. And dry, dry pastels allow me to mix them aside and then have this smooth gradient uh, in, the sp in the space in between. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, yeah, it was so fun to see some of your process footage and just like how you're going with the exacto knife. It's just such a, such a beautiful piece. Uh, thank you. Next, I'd love to turn, turn to Joni. Um, Joni Lemercier. So Joni, can you hear me? Sure. Yes, sure. Okay, fantastic. So Joni, your, your, your piece, Fine Particles, uh, it makes me, it makes me think of pointillism and, um, let me bring it up. So Pointillism practiced by Georges Sirac and Paul Sinyak, among others, was a form of political activism that demonstrated their vision of self-actualized liberation by individuals contributing to the group while simultaneously remaining separate from each other. How does the aesthetic of fine particles seek to achieve or plant the seeds of liberation in terms of climate activism? How does putting boundaries around cloud forms change the way we think about our own ability to contribute to positive climate change? Wow, thank you about that very uh, articulated uh, uh, question, very sort of technical about pantilism. First, I'm really sorry I can't share the video with you because I'm in the mountains in on a tiny chalet with, with my phone as a, on edge. So I hope you can hear me okay. 
Um, but yeah, it's funny that you you mentioned uh, activism because this piece is um, actually a, a sort of uh, an abstract piece uh, on the first look. But um, it, it's actually a long story, but I'll, I'll try to make the long story short. Um, four years ago, I became an activist when I visited um, the coal mines of Germany, which it, it's actually only like two hours from uh, Brussels. And I was shocked by the landscape because everything there is completely destroyed. Uh, villages are being raised. The forest is being cut. Um, so, so it's a very sad and dark place. But there's also some sort of beauty when you get close to the mine because the, the it, it sort of looks like the end of the world, but there's something in the, the colors of the soil, the big machines that are sort of digging that, that is really fascinating to me. And uh, part of that really sort of dark landscapes are the power plants um, around the coal mine. Uh -oh. um, and the clouds and the smoke coming out of these uh, coal power plants are, are really, really um, mesmerizing almost uh, because it looks beautiful. It's like what, what, uh, what you can find in the art history in the sublime. Uh, the German romantic painters actually in the 19th century were uh, trying to capture the sublime. It's like this nature, these landscapes that are so big that you cannot comprehend them. So there's a sense of sublime in the clouds. Uh, and I've been representing clouds for three or four years now. And this particular series, Fine Particles, it's actually, imagine making like a close-up of those clouds. That's why you sort of see some uh, sort of vaporous textures and you, you can see like the edge of smoke or something. And there's a lot of pollutions, uh, pollution around this coal mine, um, a lot of fine particles in the air, a lot of um, chemicals that are really poisoning the air. So in the way I created this series and these plot of drawings, I wanted to feel like you're looking into a, a small piece of a cloud or maybe smoke. And then those little um, squares that we can see on the screen right now are almost like doing an analysis of those clouds, uh, almost like using technology to scan through those uh, plumes of smoke and try to find those uh, pollutant and, and chemicals. Uh, and so uh, uh, these power plants, they don't only uh, exhaust uh, CO2, but also nitrous oxides, sulfur dioxide, mercury, lead, cadmium, arsenic. So it's a lot of like very, very ter terrifying um, uh, pollutants because they kill, I think in Europe, it's about 800,000 uh, deaths every year. And it, it really scares me. And I wanted to use uh, digital art and algorithm to somehow make visible those invisible particles because they are too small. Uh, they're, too, they're not visible to, to the human eye. Uh, so I wanted to lay those particles on paper and uh, sort of suggest that maybe with technology, we can do pretty things and maybe we can also um, uh, analyze uh, and find pollutants, chemicals, etc. So I'm on this fine line of making something uh, that I try to make beautiful, but also trying to shed some lights on those uh, health uh, issues that we have in Europe. And I could speak about this for hours about like the choice of paper and ink. I, actually, the black paper comes from uh, the inspiration from the work of Julien. Uh, I was I loved the the, the first uh, iteration of the project of Graph uh, two years ago, and uh, yeah, I just love the, the contrast that offers uh, uh, white ink on, on black paper. So also seeing the plotter sort of emerging on, on my table in my studio every day, having a different scale, a different type of um, uh, uh, of set of data analysis that I'm suggesting. It was a really, really uh, interesting process. And I must say, being part of Graph, um, also seeing the process of other artists emerging, um, even if I sort of caught the project a little late, it, it, it's really something I enjoy. Uh, see, understanding the process as much as seeing the final pieces. So I'd, I'd like to thank all of you and, and KC for inviting me for, for this project. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, this piece is remarkable. And um, I love I love how you blend uh, political activism and beauty together and to really kind of make us think about everything at once while also helping us focus on aesthetics. Casey, did you want to say something? I saw you on mute. 
No. Okay. Um, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Joni. And I appreciate you making time um, while you're in the mountains. Uh, truly. Thank you. Um, next, last, but finally, not least, I would love to turn to James Merrill. So James, let's bring up Breakpoint. Okay. So James, I've heard, or I read that when it comes to generative art with plotters, you think of the final product first and then work backwards instead of tweaking along and sort of this endless path. Now, when you envision the final product of breakpoints, what did you think of first, the order or the chaos? And did the final product evolve from where you initially started? And if so, how? Yeah, I went back and actually reflected it in my sketchbook on where I started with this project. Um, and that's typically how I start with a generative art project is I come up with a concept in my mind um, and then I sketch it out before I write any code or anything like that. And with this one, I was really intrigued by really what I enjoy doing with a pen and a piece of paper a lot of the time is just drawing some arcs and some circles and that sort of thing. Kind of a playful wandering line as I would describe it. And what if I could take that and build a relationship from that? And that's kind of the thought that synthesized this whole project. And what would that line do? Um, and then it kind of attracted me to another interest of mine, which is the ability for computers to simulate different physics, um, which is something that I've explored for a number of years. And I'm really fascinated by the idea of a computer which can kind of predict the past or the future given parameters that create reactions. And the way they do this is with this thing called the Nav Navier-Stokes uh, equations, which is kind of an unproven theory that you could essentially simulate fluid dynamics with computers. And it's really beneficial to do this for a number of reasons, because you could, you know, build spacecraft or dams or skyscrapers or, or anything, right? Like, and all this software is out there that you can do this with, just essentially play with if you want to, or maybe simulate something that's useful for humanity. For me, I was really fascinated by like making tornadoes and flamethrowers and tsunamis and just like weird, interesting things, right? Like what could you do if you made like things at disproportionate scales, that sort of thing. So coming back to kind of this project, I wanted to take this line and develop something for it to affect using some sort of simulation. And what I arrived upon is this very orderly system, which actually kind of harkens back to my first project uh, with Graph two years ago called Chaos Blocks. And, and I really like this system that is very much like formulaically put together and complementary. And then this line is just introduced and everything is kind of fractured and destroyed from that point. And that's why it's called breakpoint is the entrance of this line into this geometry. And I really wanted to just use, I would say, as little random as possible. Um, and I think about the, the role of random in generative art a lot because when I first started, everything was random. And now for me, it's mostly relationships and very little random. So the line, the format of the line and the format of the shape, yes, that's random, but what happens is all based on, say, the distance or the velocity or the vector of the line, so that there's not really any randomness happening. It's really like derived from this reaction of these two elements. And I took that a step further and really used uh, that relationship for color. So if you look at this piece in particular, the usage of purple here, which is kind of like the highlight color, is a derivative of the distance of the shape from the line. And once it gets outside of that proximity, it transitions into another color. And you get to kind of play with that and tweak it and just modify it. Um, and I really had a lot of fun just trying different fountain pen inks and, and pigments and that sort of thing within this work to find those complementary colors, because once you introduce them together, like you get these interesting results that you can't approximate on screen. It's really only visible on paper, which I think is the most beautiful thing about plotter art, but also the most challenging thing is the, the final resulting artwork oftentimes does look slightly different and more beautiful than what you can see on screen because screens just can't emulate completely what we can do with different inks and that sort of thing. Thank you so much. Um... That's incredible about the about the contrasting colors and sort of where where the colors come from. Um, I wonder. So I see here that the the paper looks a little bit speckled. Is it is it a 
textured paper that you're using here too? Yeah, I actually tried to emulate kind of a what the physical version would look like digitally. Uh, and that was a, a kind of finishing touch that I added, which is, you know, paper isn't necessarily flat. Like there is texture upon it. And, and the paper I'm using does have some texture. So I wanted the, the digital version of this to look more like the physical version and not the physical version to look more like the digital version, which is what you'd get with a plot. Um, so I took some steps basically to, to try to match colors, to match paper texture, that sort of thing. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, I love, I think you posted on Instagram today, like the final line or like the final, and it's just, it's such a soothing video to watch. Honestly, the plotters are like, visual therapy they're 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 wonderful um so thank you all so much for answering uh for you know for having these conversations about your individual pieces i'd love now to look at the sets um so as we know um each of these works can be collected in their set as curated here uh beginning with set number nine sets one through eight are reserved for artists curators and then one for feral file as well uh this this goes back to our to our kind of um origin story of A to P and making sure that artists can share and own each other's artwork. Uh, and so sets nine through 30 are available to collect. And as you can see here, they all, you know, they bring in just different, different aspects of each of the works. And so um, I'd love now to open up to, uh, excuse me, uh, a question for, for all of you. And uh, I hope this isn't too controversial, but do you have a set, which is your favorite? And what do you look for when you're browsing the exhibition and you're looking through the, through the different sets? Don't I all can, unmute at once. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> I, can, yeah, I can answer first. Um, I, you know, I looked through all the sets and I think it's useful to know that we didn't plan on any set, like having corresponding color palettes or anything like that. We all kind of curated our artworks uh, in a silo and they all came together and we kind of saw them all together the first time once we had all uploaded our code and that sort of thing. So it's all random. And, and obviously in gender art, that's a good thing, right? Like the more times that you have these coincidences, which are pleasant to view, the the better. Um, and I, I was looking at number 16, and I really liked it because, you know, I felt like in this one in particular, Eshkara's piece really felt like a third part of the black and white palettes, which we're seeing. Uh, so they fit with Joni's and Julian's as, as well. Um, and then I also really enjoyed kind of the complements of blue between Alexandra's and Licia's work and then pink between my work and Licia's work here as well. Well, yeah. I can go. Uh, so for me, I think my answer is not going to be, uh, I guess, too helpful if you're looking to, to collect the works because I think I'm going to pick number one. Uh, so to give a little bit of background about how my set is curated, uh, so all of those uh, outfits actually came from a collection of about 5,000 different outfits. Um, so I really spent a long time trying to figure out what uh, are the pieces that I think are going to look good on screen and also look good on paper. Uh, so the curation of any one of those outfits in the 30 is like, top of the top <laughs> in the algorithm, in my opinion. Um, and all of them, the order for all of them are randomized, except for the first one. Uh, so the, for the first one, I really felt like um, this composition and this color tells the story about the night really well. Uh, so Casey, you'll get a special pick, uh, but every other um, output is like, I think, in my opinion, already very amazing. So they're all randomized. I love them all. <laughs> yeah. I also made some notes here. I think for me, number 18 is the most crazy one. I particularly like uh, Licia's piece here from the colors. I, I don't know, there is something Kandinsky in it, you know, with the colors and the composition. And I don't know, and I love um, his style. So, and everything for me, it's a bit like outlying, you know, um, I feel my piece is very weird here. It looks like a snake. And then next to the broken one of Julian, then the, um, the Johnny one is like very black. So you can really focus on what's happening there. It's like very blurred. So I don't know. I think it's, this one is like the, maybe not my favorite, but at least the most crazy. Then I have a lot. I can just say a few, uh, two, three, four more. 
But um, yeah, number 19, I like it because I think it's um, the most different from James, which again, is not that that needs to be, you know, the, the best one, but I think it's special. So then I like number 22 because I really like how the piece from Alexandra works with the James one. And then the Joanny piece, I think is very, very shiny in the same way that some of the pieces of Julian are. I think this one is like very, for me, represents like, you know, when you're in a plane and then you see the clouds by night and there is a storm and you, and you see, you know, the, the, the storm reflecting on the, on the clouds. So I really like it. Then last, I'm just, I, I need to pick another one. Uh, well, number 24, I think we discussed that, the piece of Julian. I really like that one. Number 24. I oh, know this is not the one. Yeah, 24. I like how this piece actually works with mine because I see some, you know, connection with um, both pieces. No, this is not. This is not 24. I got confused because there was one that I really like how I worked with. Uh, Julian's one well I know this is only an example that I cannot choose I, I could just speak about every set but I had the list of I think eight one <laughs> yeah but um yeah forget about it I mean everyone if everyone can get a good one so it's okay no oh, thank you I appreciate that it's um it's so fun to see them together and I like looking at them and kind of scrolling through the sets like seeing Licia's above James's like there's sort of this like kind of fluid line that almost like continues to flow through the works and then um just the way that they've the way that they've been placed and sort of installed here just I think really highlights um like the variety of works but also how they're so connected like you can see here that like Ishka your your piece really does kind of go in like the same kind of black and white aesthetic as Joni and Julian's and then Alexandra yours is kind of like on the side here but like emerging from this black and white um corner and that, it's just really these works are also beautiful individually and then together as well um but anyone else want to want to add in their 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 favorite sets or just what they look for when they're when they're browsing no no for me for me um uh, for, for, from my point of view 23 and 24 from what I uh, explained uh, earlier, I feel that uh, Ishkra and uh, James are uh, special, special ones, and I think it fits well also with um, with the other piece on the on the on the on the screen. Uh, I, I I like also um, the, the the first one uh, because I I think it's. Uh, um we we, call, we used to call it artist artist proof uh, pieces but i feel like everyone put uh put a special effort uh on the on the first uh, piece uh, i didn't know that lisha had made a special if statements in the code for for this one uh, <laughs> and uh yeah yeah so i i would say the yeah 1 and 23 for for me Work, works uh, was good. I'm also super happy to see how they work together. As uh, you said, uh, like they're randomly positioned. Uh, we all curated our own sets and then we're surprised to see how they look on the page and scrolling through all the sets. It's really nice to see them all. I, I really can't choose any of the sets. Uh, they're equally uh, interesting to me. I'm um, just in the way that we were curating our sets and then uh, positioning them. I was also only focusing on the number one and not focusing on the rest of them. And now I'm realizing that first eight are maybe the ones that we could have uh, voted in our group to see which one we'll get but we will also randomly get other uh, exchange other pieces so it will this excitement and anticipation will continue <laughs> in the next period awesome to hear um thank you and casey yeah, I wanted to kind of go in a different direction and just say, like, we've been working so hard on this exhibition for so many months. Um, 
it's been wonderful to have it up now for a week and we can really reflect on the work and look at the work together. So I think we were just, you know, focused on, all the artists were focused on like completing their work and realizing their vision and crafting that, but then also supporting each other. I mean, the supporter on the show was just incredible meeting week to week and seeing the artists like openly sharing ideas and providing feedback for each other. I really feel like the work developed, you know, as a whole, as a group, but in this last week, being able to look really, really closely at each other's work, or in my case, looking at, at the artist's work um, has just been wonderful. And I think the appreciation of it's really grown over the last week too. And I know like when I started us off today, I was really talking about the, the drawings, the artifacts and the materiality. But you know, another thing that this walkthrough has really uh, reinforced and got into my head is that these works are, are much more than that too. <laughs> they're, they're also, um, you know, there's ideas of simulation. The software is extremely sophisticated. Um, they work extraordinarily as works on screen as well. Um, and then there's that extension that goes beyond just the, the single drawing um, into these near infinite variations. And so it's just such a wide range of exploration. And I think it's really all held together by the community of these artists um, and just how they, how they relate to each other. And so I think there's like an implicit and an inherent um, uh, way that the works are operating as, as, as a group. Um, and that's based on the, the artist's relationship and, and the way that they, they work together. Thank you. That was so wonderfully said. Um, and it really is, it really is such a treat to see them all here and to be with you all today. Uh, we will, we will close out here in just, in just a couple minutes, but I want to leave some space in case anyone wants to say, um, any, any final words or any, anything before, before we go. And if not, that's cool too. Uh, and I can just close it out uh, by saying thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, truly, it's been it's been such a gift. And I just wanna say a little bit about collecting before we go. So collecting begins on Thursday, November 16th at 1600 UTC. So that's the same time as this exhibition walkthrough started today. And it's a 24 hour highest bid auction. And anyone can place a bid by simply connecting their wallet to Feral file. And any bids placed in the last five minutes um, of the auction, extend the auction window uh, for that set for another 10 minutes. And as we've said a couple times or more than a couple times here today, all collectors receive two sets of artworks in their software form and then their physical form. And so physicals are plotted and signed by the artists in their studios and sent to collectors at no extra cost. All you have to do is make sure that your address is in the, um, is, is uploaded to your feral file account um, when you when you collect. So if you have any questions about collecting, please do feel free to DM Feral File um, or reach out on our Discord channel. We've opened one today uh, specifically for this show. And um, you can also join us Thursday. We're going to have a kickoff for the auction with a Twitter space at 1600 UTC. We love that time here. Uh, so look out for that link today on Twitter. And um, I just wanna say again, thank you so much. I do see, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, Casey, have I missed anything? No, you did such a wonderful job, Elizabeth, as always. Thank you so much for hosting and moderating. Oh, well, thank you all so much, truly. It's wonderful to be with you all. And um, I can't wait to see you all again soon. And um, good luck browsing the sets, everyone. And please do feel free to reach out. Really appreciate you all today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.